All right, so we are now recording. I'm also going to be turning on live transcript for anyone that needs it. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to the Preservation of Coral Workshops, uh, the Preservation of Coral Workshop. Uh, my name is Yusuf Raymond. I'm going to be presenting this workshop today. I also put in chat a list of chat rules that just make sure to follow that you're on mute the entire time, unless you want to participate in an activity. Um, you can use the chat at any time to ask any questions or add any comments. And um, please wait until the end to sign into the Qualtrics link, which is the sign-in sheet that we're going to be using today. Um, and if you sign in through that, you'll also be entered into the opportunity drawing for a prize at the end of this workshop. And for any more events coming up that you want to check out, check out our Sustain You website. So welcome to the Preservation of Coral Workshop um, presented by Sustain You. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to introduce you to our sustainability student assistants. My name is Yusuf Raymond, and I am the lead sustainability assistant. I have with me Andrea Coca Gonzalez and Maggie Bauer. They are also Sustain U student assistants. So, first to start off the workshop, I want to gauge your guys' knowledge on what you really know about coral reefs or anything coral in general. So, we're going to go over um, a poll that's going to be sent out right now in a few moments um, and just try your best to answer. It doesn't have to be 100% correct, but just do your best and we'll talk about it afterwards. So we'll give you guys about three or three to five minutes to answer that. So do your best, no pressure at all. You're going to learn more about this in this workshop. So are coral reefs considered animals? how much of the coral reef ecosystem will be destroyed by the year 2050, and how much of the Earth's surface do coral reefs cover? See some answers flooding in. Nice, nice, nice. All right, we got... About everyone, I think, has answered. So we'll go ahead and end. Oh, there's one more. I think we have about two people. We'll give them about 30 more seconds. All right, that's pretty much everyone. So let's go ahead and end the poll. And let's see the results. So are coral reefs considered animals? Most of you put, yes, the coral reef itself is an animal. This is actually somewhat of a trick question. The algae covering the coral reef is an animal. So B is actually the correct answer. So three of you got it right. So surprised about that. that's pretty cool. I, I got stumped by that when I first saw that. So don't even. Don't even worry about it. Um, and number two, how much of the coral reef ecosystem will be destroyed by the year 2050? 63% of you put 90% and 32% of you put 70%. You're on the right track. The answer is 90%. So most of the coral reef system is projected to be destroyed by the year 2050. And the last one, how much of the Earth's surface do coral reefs cover? This one is actually quite a hard one because it's not exactly what you'd expect. It's less than 1%. So we're going to talk about how big of an impact that less than 1% has, even though it's a fraction of the world. All right, so let's go ahead and move forward. So we're going to talk about some learning objectives um today these are the things that you're trying to take away from this workshop so one students will be able to determine the human impacts on coral reefs two students will be students will understand the impact of bleaching on coral reefs 
and students will be able to identify the leading causes of coral reef destruction. And finally, students will know prevention techniques for preservation of coral reefs. Hopefully you get to learn those today. All right, so we're gonna do an icebreaker. Um, so what you're going to do is, if you would like to, if you're comfortable with it, we are recording. So if you are comfortable with it, you can unmute yourself, turn your camera on, or you can put something in the chat as well. Um, you can say your name and from your personal experience, how did you get interested in coral reefs? What brought you to this workshop? What made you come? So if you want, I can go first as well. If no one wants to share, if they're to ease the comfort a little bit, but my name, Yusuf Raymond. Um, I actually got interested in this workshop because I always heard of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, and I always heard of how big of an impact that that has had and how it's always like had some problems with it. I didn't really know too much about it, to be honest, until researching for this workshop. And I wanted to know more about it and just how it affects the whole world because it's much more than you think. It's much more because you would think that, oh, it's just like a little, little thing in the ocean, but it's it's quite big, I'm not gonna lie. Um, learn more about human caused damage to the coral reefs. That's a very big issue that we're gonna talk about. Very big issue because it's not just doing it by itself. I'll tell you that, it's not. Anyone have any other comments or what they're interested in, what they came here for? Well, I'm here for the coral reef uh, presentation because the preservation of coral reefs is heavily linked to climate change as well as other pollution because of ocean acidification coming from the oceans heating up from absorbing carbon. I think that could be wrong, but um, that's the reason why I want to learn more about coral reefs and also because of the climate change IPCC report. Yeah, yeah, of course. You were pretty pretty close on the nail there um, of what we're going to get into this workshop. So you'll, you'll know for a fact that some of those things are true. Um, we have Jody said, I came to the workshop because I know coral reefs protect our coastlines, help our animals, and I want to know what I can do to help preserve them. That's very cool. That's very cool. They do. You guys already know so much about this. Wow. Okay. Um, also, I apologize if you hear sirens in the background. They're quite loud, but... They'll go away quickly. Uh, but yeah, we can, uh, if anyone, oh, Jeremy, I learned this in my environment class and I want to learn more about how coral reefs are important in the oceans and why they're destroyed. Very good points. You guys are pretty interested about this. I'm, I'm happy to see that more people are um, interested about this. I wanna learn about the ecosystem that relies on coral reefs to their survival and how can some species may be affected badly by the damage of coral reefs. Right on the nail, guys. We're going to go all over this into the workshop. So uh, for the sake of time, we'll move onward. But all you have great points. You're welcome to keep typing in the chat. So we're going to go over a quick video, a quick four minute video, um, just to get you a little teaser of what kind of is going on in the coral reefs. And then we'll go more about talking about it, about it. But this one's by National Geographic. And let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> Coral reefs. Their bright, vivid colors can be seen in tropical ocean waters around the globe. Beyond their brilliant appearance lies a hidden significance. Coral are animals. Though they may look like colorful plants, coral are in fact made up of tiny animals called polyps. These invertebrates can range from the size of a pinhead to a bit larger than a basketball. Each polyp consists of a soft sac-like body topped by a mouth covered in stinging tentacles. To protect their soft bodies and add support, the polyps secrete limestone skeletons or calicles. Corals are megabuilders. Polyp calicles connect to one another, creating a colony that acts as a single organism. 
As colonies grow over hundreds and thousands of years, they join with other colonies and become reefs that can grow to hundreds of miles long. The largest coral reef is Australia's Great Barrier Reef, which began growing about 20,000 years ago. Coral reefs are some of the most diverse ecosystems on Earth. Though they cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, coral reefs are home to 25% of all marine creatures. It's been estimated that up to 2 million species inhabit coral reefs, rivaling the biodiversity of the rainforest. The reefs provide rich habitat that helps protect young fish as they grow. Coral are translucent. Coral reefs get their rainbow of colors from algae, or zooxanthellae, that live in their tissue. Though corals use their tentacles to capture some food, most of their food comes from the algae they house. When coral becomes stressed by pollution or other factors, they evict their algae. Coral bleaching results revealing corals' white skeletons. Coral provide a window to the past. As coral grow, their limestone skeletons form layers, similar to tree rings, that vary in composition and thickness based on ocean conditions at the time, with some coral reefs growing for thousands or even millions of years Scientists can study these layers to reveal what the Earth's climate may have been like in the ancient past. Unfortunately, climate change is putting corals' future in danger, along with the millions of species that inhabit the reefs and the half billion people that rely on reef fish for food. Warming waters result in prolonged coral bleaching that kill coral reefs or leave them vulnerable to other threats. Without significant action on climate change, our oceans could lose many of their colorful reefs by the end of the century. All right, so that um, video was a lot of information and don't worry if you didn't take it all or didn't absorb it all, we'll go over some more of it right now. So um, yeah, let's move on. So first of all, we got to figure out what are coral, coral reefs. So coral reefs, as it, some of it said in the video, they're underwater ecosystems composed of the skeletons of colonial marine invertebrates called coral. And um, they mentioned in the video, coral polyps, the animals primary, primarily responsible for building reefs can take many forms large reef building colonies, graceful flowing fans, and even small solitary organisms. So coral polyps are really what takes up the majority of what coral reefs are. And the importance of coral reefs, obviously to know why, we, why are we trying to preserve them? Why are we trying to save them? We gotta know the importance of them. So 70% of the air that we breathe actually comes from the ocean, as some of you may know. And coral reefs specifically contribute to more than half of the oxygen our planet relies on. And these are vanishing at an unprecedented rate. And about 25% of all known marine species rely on coral reefs for food, shelter, and breeding. So it's basically their ecosystem. So it's where they house, it's where all of their food, everything, everything that they have to survive off of, it's their house. So some of the causes of destruction of coral reefs are carbon dioxide, warming waters, ocean acidification, which all those three have an intertwined factor to them, and um, also pollution, and as well as overfishing. And there's also some extra causes of destruction that we'll go into a little bit, but these are the main ones. So carbon dioxide, the average American citizen today creates over 20 tons of carbon dioxide every year. 
and that has a direct negative effect on the rising water temperatures that are destroying coral reefs around the world. And a recent study actually shows that carbon dioxide emissions, they cause the growth of coral reefs to be stunted. And um, carbon dioxide, um, we previously talked a little bit about this, but it dissolves in the ocean, which raises the ocean's acidity levels. And this prevents a buildup of calcium carbonate. And that um, is what corals draw from seawater to build their skeleton, to strengthen their skeleton so they don't break and brittle it easily. And we'll go more into about what that really is. So warming waters, warming oceans, um, they bring more marine heat waves, more heat waves in general, and to all of it, even not over the water, climate change in general. And that also causes mass coral bleaching. And along with that, ocean acidification affects the ability of calcifying corals to form the calcium carbonate, like we said, drawn from seawater. And that process is called calcification. And warming waters also reduces that calcification itself. So they're all intertwined in terms of the carbon dioxide, warming waters, and ocean acidification. So in ocean acidification, the rising acidity of the oceans threatens coral reefs by making it harder for them to build their skeletons as we previously wanted to make sure that you know. So how corals grow their skeletons is they grow it upwards towards the sunlight and they thicken them to reinforce them. This strengthens, this, which strengthens the skeleton and helps them withstand breakage caused by currents, waves, storms, and boring and biting by worms, mollusks, and parrotfish. So it's their main bone structure in a way, to their skeleton to keep them from being brittle and breaking. And recent studies show that ocean acidification particularly impedes in the thickening process. The skeleton may be there, but it's not strong enough, not thick enough um, to withstand anything. So it decreases their density and leaves them more vulnerable to breaking and not being able to be grown back on. So there's a difference between a bleached coral and a dead coral. So in these two pictures, you can see the white one is a bleached coral and the brown one is a dead coral. So old dead corals will be broken down and they lack a healthy color, but they're sometimes covered in algae still. So as you can see on the brown one, corals that have been bleached from rising ocean temperatures turn white with the symbiotic algae leaving the coral. As I said in the video previously, the, the algae is expelled and doesn't come back. It doesn't come back to grow off of that. It's a tainted surface. So some more about it um, is that reefs face multiple stresses. Um, like we talked about rising sea levels, changing nutrient regimes and warming ocean temperatures. But unlike ocean warming, this is a pretty interesting fact that causes visible bleaching, which you can see. The impact of ocean acidification is more insidious and difficult to detect, so it's harder to predict where it's going to happen and where we can actually pretty much save these corals in terms of um, ocean acidification because it's a lot harder to see when it's dying. So pollution is also a pretty big factor. This is one of the human factors that we're also going to go into a little later but they're also affected by leaking fuels and anti-fouling paints and coatings and other chemicals that enter the water. So if an oil spill occurs um, while corals are spawning, the eggs and sperm can be damaged as they float near the surface before they fertilize and settle. So in addition to compromising water qu quality, oil pollution can disrupt the reproductive success of corals, making it making them vulnerable to other types of diseases so they won't grow as strong, let alone the calcium carbonate not being sufficiently there for them to build their skeleton. They're also weaker right off the bat when they're reproduced. So overfishing also has a factor. So in many areas, coral reefs are destroyed when coral heads and brightly colored reef fishes are collected for the aquarium or jewelry trade. And careless or untrained divers can also trample fragile corals and many fishing techniques can be destructive, which 
these fishing techniques I had not known about before researching for this. And they kind of blew my mind when I found them. So the two major types of destructive fishing are blast fishing and cyanide fishing. We're going to go into what those really are. And it blew my mind. I don't know if this is common, but yeah, we'll go into it. So blast fishing. So in blast fishing, dynamite or other heavy explosives are detonated to startle fish out of their hiding places. This practice indiscriminately kills other species and can crack and stress coils so much that they expel their zooxanthellae. And the blast kills coral tissues and the surrounding rubble, and that prevents adjacent coral colonies from recovery. It prevents the building up off of different coral colonies. And I thought that was insane when I saw it, that you're just literally exploding the sea floor. And it's common across Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asia's Coral Triangle, and in Tanzania. It's not common in very many places, but it's still legal in some, which should not be a thing. So cyanide fishing is the second destructive fishing. And this involves spraying or dumping cyanide into reefs to stun and capture live fish. And that kills coral polyps and degrades the reef habitat in the process. So what they do is the divers crush cyanide tablets into a plastic squirt bottle of seawater. And they puff the solution at fish on coral heads. And the fish often flee into crevices, leaving the divers to pry and hammer the reefs apart to collect their stunned prey. So that inadvertently destroys the coral reef by the picking and prodding and also the poison that they're placing in these places so that fish can be lured out. And I, when I saw it, I was like, wow, that's an interesting form of fishing that I would never thought that existed, but it does. And some more about it is that cyanide fishing also poses human health risks, let alone itself, just the coral reef. Um, it poses to fishermen through accidental exposure to the poison and careless use of compressed air diving gear by untrained divers. And it poses a whole load of threats to the fish that they actually eat too. Um, and both practices have been made illegal in most parts of the world, like I said, but it's still in some places. So coral mining is also um, one of the factors that um, we're going to talk about, and it's an interesting kind of controversial topic. So coral is turned into limestone or cement substitute for use of building material. And in the Maldives, a 1995 study shows that 20,000 cubic meters of coral per year were collected solely for construction materials. And that's because it's the cheapest material to use to build their roads, houses, and seawalls. So that brings into a factor of whether like economy is the right way to go about it. But obviously there's some differing opinions on that. And also corals mined into jewelry, which that's one of the things that I can clearly see is not ethical. And um, coral is also useful in the medical field for bone graft clinical trials. So coral reefs also act as a protection to the land among all these things that if they're mined, they're protection to the land with things someone stated earlier um, and the land just beyond it. Um, when a reef is partially or completely removed, the shore becomes more vulnerable to storms and other natural disasters because coral reefs kind of absorb some of the sea waves and, and, and different things that happen in the ocean that could lead onto land they kind of prevent it due to some absorption at the sea floor. However, there is technically a way for coral to regenerate. So coral mining can be done in a sustainable matter, in a sustainable manner where small pieces of coral are taken and leftovers can regenerate. However, it can only be done if there's enough time between each harvest. So reefs that have been mined extensively can take 20 years or more to recover. So you can see it's not a super sustainable um, building material to actually use because it does not provide enough material for the time that you have to wait for. 
So now we're going to talk about the main direct effects on humans. What would happen if more coral reefs die? We're going to talk about ocean life, economy, and tourism. So ocean life. The NOAA says if nothing is done by the year 2050, over 90% of the world's reefs and accompanying ecosystems will die. As you've seen in the coral poll that we did, that was one of the questions. So they house 25% of all sea organisms, about 25% of all ocean life. That's 25% of our carbon dioxide poisoning buffers. With reefs gone, the climate disaster will only begin to rapidly increase. And species that are dependent on other species, or well, we most know the saying that species are dependent on other species above and below the ecosystem. There's a food chain, there's a food cycle, everything is a life cycle. When 25% of them are gone, that system will tend to crumble. 25% of that food chain disappears because no one has housing, food, or shelter in their ecosystem, the system's gonna crumble. There's also the economy factor. So healthy coral reefs support commercial and substance fisheries, as well as jobs and businesses through tourism and recreation. There is a way of safe fishing. Um, it approximately half of all federally managed fisheries depend on coral reefs and related habitats for a portion of their life cycles. So that kind of goes with the tourism factor. So local economies also receive billions of dollars from visitors to reefs through diving tours. Now, if they're done correctly, they're not harmful. If there's no touching of coral reefs or anything like that. And they're also through recreational fishing trips, hotels, restaurants, and other businesses based near coral reefs. It's an attraction, it's a tourism site. It's like Disneyland. People go to it, want to see it, and it brings in money. Now let's talk about Aquarium of the Pacific. So Aquarium of the Pacific does have um, their initiatives. They contribute to climate change initiatives and coral reef cons conservation organizations. So what they have is um, they have a firsthand kind of look. If you want to see a firsthand look in Long Beach, because this is centered in Long Beach, the Aquarium of the Pacific is in Long Beach. You can see that the initiatives that the Aquarium of the Pacific has promoted about coral reefs, they're really aiming to showcase exactly what it should look like, what the coral reef should look like if there were no carbon dioxide, carbon emissions, ocean acidification, and things like that. And it gives you some of the inhabitants of the coral reef too. So it gives you a better perspective on how it really affects you and how you can see it for firsthand. And um, it gives you perspective of the beautiful corals. And you can see glowing corals and green sea turtles and their sustainable initiatives and their rescues, of course. So I've been talking all about the problems, different things that are going on. So now let's talk about what steps can we actually take to help circumvent this. So there is an organization called Reef Revive, and we can contribute to that. Um, it carries out a large scale reef habitat recreation project, or uh, different projects, and helps fund smaller scale local projects to fuel a positive environmental change. So they help nurture coral farms and reintroduce them into these new habitats, thus doubling the effectiveness of new habitat locations. We'll talk more about that in the next slide. So most of the world's coral reefs are found in third world locations, which makes it conservation funding kind of difficult to fund on their own. And it kind of sets that into a way where we don't really see it. So we don't really think that it's affecting us, but Reef Revive gains their full authorization over a given area of coastal ocean, and they begin to completely restore the area with a new habitat that not only rejuvenates active sea life in that area, but helps grow back the flora that removes massive amounts of carbon in the air as well. So it goes back to that carbon buffer and reduces the amount of carbon that is absorbed into our ocean and increasing our climate change. 
And one of these cool initiatives that I thought they were doing, or that I found they were doing, they're 3D printing new habitats with environmentally safe limestone composite, which is proven to be the best surface for coral reef for coral regrowth and home to all the sea life. So I thought that was so cool that they're using 3D printers, using limestone composite, and building a place that corals could grow on. Like that was so interesting to me. And there's also a cool new initiative called cloud brightening. So microscopic seawater droplets, they're sprayed into the air, that's what happens, and evaporating, they evaporate and leave just a nano-sized sea crystal, sea salt crystal, which acts as a seed for cloud droplets and brightening existing clouds and it deflects solar energy away from the reef waters when heat stress is at a maximum. So we talked about those marine heat waves um, and the clouds, they basically block the sun from having such a big impact on the ocean and into the coral reefs because coral reefs actually are not that far down into the water. They only go about 40 feet down. They don't go much farther than that because they need sunlight to, re to survive as we talked about in um, how they grow towards the sunlight. And so it's really cool that this initiative is talking about lessening the effect of the sun. And this is led by students at Southern Cross University. So students can do it too. So another organization, Coral Reef Alliance, this, they mainly work in Hawaii and Mesoamerican region to help reduce local and global threats to coral reefs. So they believe the best thing you can do is reduce your carbon footprint. You guys might have heard this over and over again, but it is a impactful thing if everybody does it. It's not just one person, it's everybody. So you can reuse bags for groceries. I know that different spots around Long Beach, if you are located in Long Beach and all around, they require you to pay for grocery or grocery bags anyway. So might as well bring your own. Two birds, one stone. And use reusable containers as well. Try to limit your plastic use. Start your own compost. You can actually start your own compost in um, if you have a garden or anything like that. You can build your own compost and use that compost to nurture your garden as well. There's different kinds of compost. If you hang out to another sustain you events, tabling, anything like that, you can always ask us more about compost. We had initiatives about that. And um, you can plant a rain garden to absorb runoff and eat sustainable seafood. So know where your seafood is coming from. Know that it's not got gained in an immoral way. So we actually got the chance to interview um, a person from an organization called Parlay. Um, his name was Nicholas, and he, hold on a second, Parlay was an organization um, for the oceans, and it's an organization that addresses major threats to the oceans. So we interviewed him, and he taught over 25,000 students about ocean conservation all along the West Coast, whether it was talking about plastic pollution, coral reef preservation, anything along those lines of keeping our ocean healthy and clean. And his main goal is to direct people towards the solutions, not just give them the issue and leave them with that. Because a lot of it, I could tell you so much to educate you on the topic, but it's about what you can really do next that's really gonna make an impact. So it's not only about changing everything at once, it's about getting you to start thinking and take one small step at a time, because it's not gonna happen overnight but it can happen eventually. And people, most of the time, people don't um, want to worry about it because they have a lot on their plate, you know, and um, they don't really know what's going on. Say your coral reefs are out of mind, they're out of sight. They aren't in front of you, so you don't really think about it, but we're at a tipping point. And Nicholas actually got involved in Parlay because he surfs and he hated seeing plastic pollution in the ocean. So it's really interesting seeing a firsthand sight, if any of you, Obviously we are a beach school. So most of you have probably been to the beach. If you haven't, check it out, it's a cool time. Um, but it's, you can see the plastic on the, the trash, the plastic in the, in the sand, and that washes into the ocean. That came from the ocean and vice versa. So it's really important 
to understand and move forward. So one way we can is reef safe sunscreen. So some of you may know this, some of you may not, but when you swim with sunscreen on, chemicals like oxybenzone seep in the water and they're absorbed by coral. So they disrupt coral reproductive and growth cycles similar to how oil, uh, how oil does, and it leads to bleaching. So 14,000 ton, 14, tons of sunscreen wash into oceans a year. And 80% of the corals in the Caribbean have been lo lost in the last 50 years due to this type of pollution. People going to the Caribbeans on vacation, different things like that, and people just there in general using sunscreen. That has a harm on the ocean itself from the oxybenzone. Now, what can you do to have a solution of that? Choose mineral-based sunblock with zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. You have to make sure to check if your sunscreen has oxybenzone in it. If it does, don't use it. Um, and no aerosols. Most of the time, if aerosols, if they have, um, if they aren't reef safe sunscreen along with aerosol, what happens is if you're at the beach, you spray some aerosol on you, you spray all the sunscreen on you, and some of it gets on the sand, not all of it gets on your body. And what happens is the water, when the tide rises later that day or whenever it does, it washes up onto that sunscreen that's in the sand and it washes back into the ocean and it circulates around the entire ocean. So it can, even if you're not going in the water, you can still have an effect on it. Um, and you can always take shade instead. May not be the most plausible option, but if you don't like going in the water, there's your, there's your win. You take the shade instead. And make sure your reef safe sunscreen is free of oxybenzone, like I said. There's also another factor of genetic modification. So what they're trying to do is they release some corals created in the lab by breeding two groups of the same species, one that resisted bleaching and another that didn't. And lots of people have concerns. However, most believe it's a plausible option. So the ones that resisted bleaching may have had a stronger skeleton or gene, gene in a way, um, and they are essentially manufacturing corals to be stronger to fight. But that's, in a sense, not a final destination that we want to go for. We want to go for decreasing our carbon emissions and preventing climate change. So here's some 10 ways to protect that you can protect coral reefs. So some of these we talked about already, but we'll go over them. Choosing sustainable seafood. You can uh, learn how to make smart seafood choices by visiting fishwatch.gov. Um, conserving your water, less water you use, less runoff, wastewater, and eventually most of that water leads back to the ocean. And you can volunteer at local beach cleanups uh, if you live near a coast, which hopefully some of us do, um, and get involved. You can protect the oceans. And coral reefs are, or corals are already a gift. Don't give them as presents. Don't buy coral jewelry. Don't buy things of that nature. Just don't support it because it's not sustainable. And long lasting light bulbs, also a great idea. If you dive, this goes without saying, don't touch the reefs. You could potentially break them. They are alive. Check your sunscreen, like we said. Be a marine crusader. Don't send chemicals into the waterways and practice safe boating. If you're ever in a situation where you are boating, don't lay your anchor in your coral reef. and It'll drag and destroy some reefs. So to tie it all together, one, you have to know the importance of coral reefs to understand why we should preserve them. There's no point in just doing it willy-nilly, not even thinking about it. We talked about some of the things, why they're important. And their beauty, importance, effectiveness, and nature is essential to all life on Earth. And awareness is necessary, not only to the coral reefs, but the effect that ocean pollution and climate change have on them. So some short-term and long-term goals that 
you generally want to go for is in the long term, coral reefs around the world will benefit the most from reduction of greenhouse gases, like we talked about. In the short term, we can improve coral reef resilience by addressing local stressors, like runoff from land-based sources of pollution and over-harvesting of fish and your trash and things you may drop, say, on the floor. Hopefully none of you do that, but always making sure to pick up after yourself. So um, we have a little bit more after this, so stick around. But if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to ask them what questions do you have? I see one in the chat. Is it possible to get these slides shared after the workshop? Um, you can email us at the sustain you email that we'll have at the end of this workshop if you would like a copy of it and we can um, um, possibly provide you a copy on that, but it won't be posted to the general public. I have a question. Yeah. Go for um, it. So I saw that the NOAA number was based on if nothing was done about it. Uh, but I was thinking how much of the coral reefs would be saved or how much less destruction would there be saved if the effects, I'm saying like if the te global temperature rise was kept within 1.5 or two degrees Celsius versus like three or, or four really dangerous temperature rises. That I, I cannot give you an answer on that because I, I don't have the necessary facts and research behind that but I can get back to you on that. On, um, but I do imagine that it would be less than 90%. Is, the goal is anything less than 90. That's is essentially what we're looking for. If all of these contributors happen all at once and we all make sure we're trying to make an impact, whether it's through anything that I said previously, the goal is to lower that number, but the exact number, I can't give you that answer without possibly being wrong, so. I can get back to you on that though. Anyone have any other questions? Um, I actually have a quick question about sustain you. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you do like any or have like any volunteer opportunities or anything for like beach or ocean related um jobs or anything yeah or if you even um, do the stuff like that things like that so we do have a volunteer interest list we haven't um necessarily picked any volunteers yet but um if you do email us at the sustain you email um it'll come up at the end so don't worry about that if you email us there we can put your name down as an interest and however Things like beach cleanups and stuff, those we do not have. The thing is, the problem with that is it's not on campus and we can't really facilitate as much outside of campus. So as sustain you as a department, we've chosen to not typically go that direction. I, for one, totally would be all for it. I'm still trying to get it done, but there's no guarantee that we do have like beach initiatives of cleanups and stuff like that. But there are um, behind the scenes like work in terms of helping with workshops and um, different things like that in terms of being a volunteer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Um, yeah, so I have a quick question. Um, yeah. I, I, know, I know you talked about the um, impact on our economy in terms of how um, people are affected when it comes to coral reefs? I'm sorry, would you just like talk a little bit about that again? Uh, the impact of the economy, you said? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we can go back to that slide actually. Um, the main consensus of the impact was that um, the coral reefs essentially, they provide themselves as an attraction. So there's a tourism impact and there's an economy impact as well of plain economy, it was actually that slide right there, yep. Um, so they support commercial and substance fisheries as well as jobs and businesses. So they do house these fishes in terms of sustainable fishing. There is a way to do sustainable fishing that's not blast fishing and cyanide fishing. Um, those are the two most reckless ways. So 
possible means of that, that can help with tourism and recreation and, and different things like that. However, the one main concern we have to worry about is how we're getting our fish. And in terms of mass, even um, nets, the plastic can get stuck on the coral reefs as well. So in terms of sustainable fishing, that's another topic entirely on its own. But uh, that affects the economy in terms of what fish we get, how, how much fish we get, and um, all the fisheries typically, they take a portion of the coral reef life cycle. So it depends on that, as well as, um, we can go to the next slide, the tourism factor is also one of the biggest ones that they bring a entire factor of the coral reefs and fishing trips, hotels, restaurants as an attraction in itself. That, for, I, for one, would love to see coral reefs. I wouldn't touch them, obviously, but just to see the, the glowing colors and different things like that, that's what would bring my eye into spending some money for it. Hopefully that answered your question. Yes, it did. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, we can go to the end again, to the question slide. Um, all right, for the sake of time, we'll move on. Uh, if anyone has questions afterwards, they can stay a little bit if you'd like. But we'll move on to whenever the slide comes up. I believe it's the sustainability month. Okay, so next month is sustainability month. So that is going to be the month where we have a couple workshops that we partner with different people. So one uh, coming up October 6th is the Clean Air Cool Rides event. That one um, hosted by the uh, transportation uh, of Long Beach. And we're partnering with them also to promote our Grove Beach University Garden that we are starting up hopefully in the near future. So if you stop by that, it's tabling. It's going to be tabling on Friendship Walk on October 6th. And the other event you can see listed as well, Understanding Climate Crisis, Greening the Red Sustainable Menstruation, Environmental Impact of Lithium Batteries. That one's going to be solely hosted by us. So come out to that one. Uh, sustainable Speaker Spirit Series and Open House Green Building Tours. So if you have any more questions about that, um, refer to the info at cclb.edu sustainability month. So we're gonna go into the opportunity drawing now. So this might've been what you all are waiting for. So let me paste a link into the chat. That's going to be the sign in. And there you go. So please be sure to click that if you do want to be entered into the opportunity drawing one for that. And then also if you have come to this workshop for any extra credit reasons. So uh, on that, link it's going to say just your name your cclb email id and if you're able to pick up your prize on campus and if you are intending this workshop put your professor's name or for extra credit put your professor's name below if not just put na and you should be fine but let's get into who is going to get what are you going to get if you get third place the way it's going to work is we're going to draw your name draw three names throughout the that have entered into this workshop. And if you get third place, you'll be getting, drum roll. Third, oh, just gave away second and first. But <laughs> third place, you'll be getting reef safe sunscreen. So this is oxybenzone and octanoxate free. So that's what third place will be getting. Um, the way that's gonna work is when you get, when we roll the, uh, the wheel, it's not gonna be today, but when we do roll it, We'll email you if you provided your correct email, your CSULB email on there. And um, we'll email you that you have won if you'd like to receive the prize and you're able to pick it up on campus. So just look out for that email within the, within the next week. And second place, we'll be getting drum roll, Great Barrier Reef bracelet. So every bracelet purchased funds, um, purchased funds the removal of one pound of trash from the ocean and coastline. So there is an option to pick the different type of color that you want necessarily. It's not going to be this color, but we'll work that out in the email um, thread. And first place we'll be getting Enso Coral Reef Rings. So they are a sustainable silicone ring. 
for each ring or bracelet sold, they'll donate $2 to the Coral Restoration Foundation. So it does come in different colors, bright colors, not made of corals, trust me, it's not, but it does give you that semblance of corals and something to remember this workshop by. Next slide. So um, that closes out to the end. Stay if you wanna see our contact info, but um, I always like to leave with, the, with a nice quote. So the greatest danger to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. That's by Robert Swan. And I think that was really influential that I wanted to just leave you guys with. Um, and we can go to the next slide. And these are just a list of my references, uh, if you are curious where I got this information. And you can also contact us. Uh, we do, uh, our location is in the USU room 238. And we also have an email, ASI sustain you at csulb.edu. If you do have any further questions, volunteer, anything like that. Um, if you also request to sign up for our email list serve, if you would like to be notified for future workshops. And our website is also ASI CSULB, Corporate Discover Sustain You. So if anyone has any further questions, you are welcome to stay. If not, thank you guys for coming to this workshop and you are free to leave. As long as you sign into that Qualtrics link, you'll be put into the opportunity drawing. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, Alda. Oh yeah, I can send the link again. Yeah, no problem, Alvin. If that ever happens in the future, uh, you can always just email us. If you registered for the meeting, we know who went. Yeah, no problem, have a great day. The rest of your night, rather. All right, that's everyone. Let's excellent job. Everyone.